My story is the story of uh, my brother's death. He died in 2004, in February. It's very similar to Ms. Ortiz. Um, I'm sure and it's been familiar to a lot of you as well as the patterns of mental illness, needing help, not being able to find help, being hesitant to call police, where you turn. Um, you know, it's very disruptive to a family when someone's disoriented and you know there's something wrong with them, but you don't know what. You're afraid if they go for a walk, something will happen to them on the street. Maybe they'll get hit by a car. Maybe they'll decide to take a walk on the railroad tracks. You know, you just don't know. And maybe we're from the um, South Fork of Long Island, Southampton, New York, and it was, it, it felt like family. You know, um, the police were our friends and neighbors. We trusted our friends and neighbors to look after him. Um, so we really weren't afraid to call the police in the beginning. And we were always there when they came and we felt that he was cared for. We, um, you know, were nervous about him being alone, what would happen, but we were always there. It felt like family by a family member, like how could this happen? You know, I firmly believe that if this could happen to him, this could happen to anyone. One of the police officers involved in his death went to high school with my brother. He was not a stranger. He was not a stranger to police, not only in a negative way, as having encounters with them or us needing to call them for help, but he was not a stranger to police in a community way. He was an active member of the community. You know, of some very small community that was intimate, you know, and knew each other well. On uh, the day he died, uh, he was having a mental episode. He was disoriented. He didn't feel well. Uh, he wanted to go out for a walk and get air. We were really concerned about him being alone. You know, we also lived near the sea. What if someone decides to go for a swim in the ocean? and they can't, you know, get back. Uh, so we called the police for help. He had left the house. He was carrying his Bible. And he went to go to the local church to pray, which is two blocks away. Very short blocks, less than a mile from the house. Uh, the police encountered him on the front lawn of a Catholic school and stopped him and asked him, you know, to come with them. And he disagreed. He was afraid to go into the hospital. He was afraid to go with police. And again, no one was there, but what ensued was so violent, it's just beyond comprehension. Uh, my brother, from autopsy reports, my brother was beaten from the top of his head to the bottoms of his feet. He had 18 taser burns on his body. He was pepper sprayed. Um, every plane of his face was beaten. That So, you know, when you get hit like this or you fall, you hit one plane of your face. To have every plane of your face beaten, you have to be hit at least nine times. It, it was just brutal. And an entire, this was in the middle of the day on a public street on the front lawn of the Catholic school, on church property where my family, you know, has been a member of the parish for generations, where my brother was christened, where my own son was christened, where my parents were married. How could this happen here? How could it happen? Um, anyway, his death and the level of brutality really illustrates the need to have intervention and so, uh, some buffer between the police and the mentally ill. Um, some of the taunting that you described about Mama's boy, people overheard the police saying to my brother during the incident, um, you know, someone forgot to take their medication today, it's medication time, you know where you go when you don't take your medication, you know, which only agitates them further. And, um, you know, I feel very passionate about the need for uh, intervention between the people. It, his death only illustrates it very, very vividly that um, the police don't have
had very many tools to deal with the mentally ill and, and the desperate need for to put those tools in place.